Hello, I am Elaine Buck and I am a social worker at the Pacific Parkinson's Research Center in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And I am very happy to welcome you all today and thank you for joining us for the launch of the second Care Partner virtual series. <clears throat> it's a four part series addressing some important issues for uh, Parkinson's care partners. And I certainly do appreciate that carving out time to attend this kind of offering is not always easy. And certainly if you have missed any of the previous um, parts of this series, know that they are recorded and have been archived on our uh, the WPC website. Before I go on, I just want to to acknowledge kind of what uncertain times and stressful times we have and continue to live in. I know that this can be particularly difficult for care partners who have found or are still finding themselves isolated or unable to uh, access their normal support networks. And so through this series, we are really hoping to provide you with some useful information that will not only help you, but also remind you that you are not alone in this journey. Our last series was really well received but we did hear from some of you that um, some of the information or the way in which uh, the information was provided was a little bit too positive uh, when covering some of those more difficult or tough issues. And we really never want to sugarcoat the challenges. And so with this new series, we've really asked our speakers to find a balance, a balance and how to address challenges in a positive way, but also recognize that things are not always easy or they are not always positive. So we're going to look a little bit more deeply at resilience and how you can best support yourself and be supported. So we really do thank you for that frank feedback that we've received during our last series and hope that you will find some value in the series going forward this year. I also want to remind our listeners that you all come to today's talk from different places geographically, but also emotionally and with different experiences. And so we have uh, care partners on the panel, one who's at an earlier stage in the um, experience and someone who is at another stage at the experience. And hopefully we will be able to offer those two perspectives on the care partnering experience. Now, some of the panelists may cover uh, information that you already know, but also know that some people might be hearing this for the first time. And so, um, again, this will allow us to have those different experiences and meet the needs of most everybody who is attending. So we thank you for your understanding of that in advance and feel quite confident that no matter where you are on your journey, you will hear a pearl that you'll walk away with today. We have, I think, around 200 people tuning in today from many different uh, countries. Most of those people are care partners of people with Parkinson's, but we also have family members, people with Parkinson's themselves, as well as um, healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses, social workers, rehab experts. So a warm welcome to all of you as well. Now, if you have to leave before the session is over, do kindly, kindly ask you to complete the survey, which is at the top right-hand corner of your screen. And as an incentive to anybody who completes this quick five-question survey, your name will go into a draw to win a free Parky um, the Raccoon WPC mascot. So uh, with, with appreciation, we do, we do really value hearing your feedback. So if you do have to um, jump off, then uh, please remember to do the survey. And on the same lines, um, the, this is recorded. And so feel, don't feel that you need to take notes because the webinar will live live on the WPC website as well as a printed up summary. So sit back, relax and take it all in. 
Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the two sponsors that have made the 2021 uh, series possible, and that is Supernus um, uh, Pharmaceuticals, which has already committed to being a platinum sponsor for the WPC 2023 in Barcelona, and Kira Co. Kiowa Kieran as well. Uh, we really would not be here without um, without their support. Um, okay, so today our panelists are going to be talking about care partnering in Parkinson's, the emotional roller coaster. We're going to do a deep dive into the emotional roller coaster uh, as many um, PD care partners experience from the time of di diagnosis and over time. We want to normalize and demystify some of those emotions firsthand with accounts from our care partners today and provide some practical tips and how to cope from their experiences. Now, while the um, panelists are doing their talks, please feel free to submit your questions into the chat. We will address as many of the questions as we can, and mostly at the end of the panel. So feel free to add them in as we go along. Okay, so now I would like to just introduce you to our panelists. Um, Elizabeth Delaney is a licensed social worker with a master's degree from Columbia University. She lives in New York City and works as the social worker and center coordinator for the Neurological Institute at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. We also have Bill Shapiro, who is a care partner to his wife who has had Parkinson's disease for 10 years. He is a retired psychologist with expertise in group work and um, in group work with older adults. He finds great satisfaction in supporting uh, or in facilitating a support group uh, for care partners and really to help with those emotional challenges of caring for somebody with Parkinson's. And we have Karen St. Clair who is a care partner to her husband, Rob, uh, who has lived with Parkinson's for over 20 years. She is an active Parkinson's advocate at the state and national levels and facilitates two Parkinson's support groups in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So let's start with Elizabeth. Um, and I really loved the title of the talk that she sent to us, Riding the Emotional Roller Coaster Through the PD, throughout the PD journey, it's all normal. Over to you, Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, and thank you everyone for joining and taking the time uh, to come learn a little bit more. Um, and like Elaine said, if, if some of these things you already heard, we hope that you walk away with a few nuggets of information that can make your journey a little bit easier. Um, as Lane said, we are here to discuss the emotional roller coaster that is the Parkinson's journey. Of course, throughout this journey, there are highs and lows, and it is important to know what you can do as a care partner to support not only your loved one, but how you can support yourself um, and how you can take care of yourself to be able to care for your loved one. And so when we're thinking of highs and lows, um, I think at both points, of this roller coaster, you might experience some emotional reactions or responses, particularly to the dips in the roller coaster. Um, and these dips can occur, I think, throughout the PD journey. So you might experience some significant emotional reactions or responses at the beginning when the diagnosis is first given to your loved one. Um, it might occur, you know, during a shift in status of the condition or a change in the condition. Um, and that could certainly spark an emotional response or reaction. And, you know, whatever your response is, it's important to note that the emotional response that you experience as a care partner can and likely will differ um, from that of your loved one or the person with Parkinson's. Um, and that that is okay. Um, your emotions are valid, um, just as those emotions that build up uh, your loved one are. Um, and it's important that we kind of provide you tools, tips, and tricks of the trade to navigate these differences. Um, but the first step is to acknowledge that your response, although might, it might differ from your loved one or your partner's, is normal. And to give words to the emotions and feelings that you're experiencing um, and to be able to share your emotions uh, in a confident way and to seek support if you need it. 
And so when we're thinking about the different emotions that can occur throughout the PD journey uh, and what the, the Parkinson's journey looks like, um, I like to, you know, consider what losses are occurring um, and when, where there is loss, there's likely grief. Um, and so grief is a, certainly a, a specific type of emotional response to loss. Um, and I think in general, when we think about loss and grief, we tend to think of ordinary loss. So the loss of a physical presence of something or someone in your world or your life. But when it comes to Parkinson's, we should also consider ambiguous losses. The losses that occur without closure or are kind of unclear. They don't have a clear understanding of what the loss might entail. Um, and these losses can be experienced by both the person with Parkinson's um, or the care partner. And so an example of a type of loss that might occur throughout the, the Parkinson's journey, the loss of function. Maybe your loved one is no longer able to drive and that might create sort of a struggle or, or rift between you two in determining how to navigate that change. Um, maybe your loved one has difficulty doing certain activities that you as a care partner, you might be spouse or adult child, like to do with that person. They, they no longer can do that or it might look different how you do that. Um, or a loss can be ability to maybe communicate um, needs, whether that be to speech deficits or cognitive changes. Um, and one that I find that often comes up when I speak to care partners um, is a loss or kind of a, a sense of not feeling themselves, a loss of identity or sense of self. So, you know, they start to question, what is my relation to others, to my spouse, who I'm now caring for, and what is my relation to the world? How do I fit in now with this new role as care partner? And so the reactions to these types of losses or changes, um, these ambiguous losses, can be just the same as ordinary losses. And so I think if you kind of Google grief, <laughs> there are two different kinds of stage models uh, that are out there, five stage or seven stage grief models. Um, so I'm just focusing on the kind of five stages of grief that we can consider when thinking about loss. Um, and those can include denial. Um, I think we tend to see that maybe towards the beginning, especially in the journey when a diagnosis is received. Some people might seek second or third opinions, which is okay, because um, it's normal to experience this sense of denial in the beginning um, or throughout the, the course of the journey as well. It could be anger. And that could be maybe you get angry at the disease itself. Maybe you find that sometimes you get angry with your loved one then feel guilty for it after. Um, bargaining can certainly occur. Depression, um, as we move along, I think we want to make sure that we notice any signs of depression to make sure that it's treated. Um, and acceptance, usually another stage of grief. Now, when we look at these five stages of grief, um, it's important to note that these stages will look different person to person, and some may experience all the stages, some may only experience a few. Um, and even though they are stages and their significance to the order they're placed, I personally believe that there is really no order um, in how you might experience these different stages, and you might return to one. So maybe in the, the, the beginning of the journey, you sort of accepted the diagnosis, um, but then, you know, a change occurs or a shifting condition occurs later down the road, and you might have to go through those stages or one or several of them again, uh, and that's okay. But it's just important to know, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, you know, things that you can do to support yourself um, as you experience these changes. And I would like to point out that, you know, if your, your grief starts to impact your day-to-day -day life, your functioning, your relationship, you know, your ability to work, um, it, it would be important to bring that up to your providers and try to seek some sort of um, help from a professional mental health counselor, perhaps, or a support network um, to help you with processing um, that grief. And so once you have kind of sorted through or gone through some of these stages of grief, um, or maybe you've processed the re your reaction to the initial diagnosis, you might find yourself wanting to connect with others. Uh, the how or when or where or with who you share your story um, is certainly up to you. Um, it's important to seek support um, because it isn't very, it's very important to give voice to your experience and your story. Uh, and I like to say that, you know, we call um, you all care partners because it is a partnership. Um, and in thinking of that partnership, I will say, you know, it is 
up to you how you'd like to share your journey, but making sure you're consulting your loved one about a good time um, to share that diagnosis or your experience with others because you are in it together. So making sure you're on the same page with your partner about who you share the diagnosis with, um, when you do that um, can certainly be important. And I think it's also important to create maybe a pros and cons list of, you know, the pros and cons of sharing a diagnosis and consulting your partner about, you know, your pros and your cons versus theirs. Um, I think often I hear a fear that uh, people have when they are starting to think about sharing their experience or the diagnosis with others, families, friends, is that they're afraid that those people that they share it with don't, quote unquote, want to deal with that, or they're afraid that they won't hear from them anymore. And sure, this might be the case for a select few, um, that you might not hear from those friends or members as, as often as you once had. But I've also often heard that people are quite surprised by how willing others are to lend a hand or to help um, when there is a need. Uh, and another pro of sharing your experience is to be able to expand your support network. Um, and you know, it is a shared decision, um, it's shared decision making that goes beyond the diagnosis. So working with your partner um, throughout the Parkinson's journey to make sure you're on the same page and making decisions together. And so you talk to your partner about sharing the, your experience and diagnosis and you have this, you know, want to do so. Uh, and your partner has maybe begun to form their own support network um, with other people with Parkinson's. And you may say, but I kind of feel a little bit guilty for giving voice to my own emotions, feelings, or experiences. Uh, I, I need to be strong for my partner, so I can't really express too many emotions. Um, and, and what I usually tell people is that a strong care partner is one who can be sure to take care of themselves. Um, so being able to you know, vocalize your, your feelings, your emotions, and your own struggles will in turn enable you to become a stronger care partner. And so allow your space, yourself the space um, and time to process your own feelings, whether that be in, the, in a support group, one-on-one -on -one, um, with a trusted friend or family member. Um, and try to not be too careful uh, you know, we kind of mentioned not wanting to sugarcoat things. Try not to be too careful around one another, whether that be your family members or the person with Parkinson's, because you'd like to have, you know, an open line of communication. Um, you want to feel comfortable with one another and being able to express your concerns. Um, so having open conversations and discussions while maintaining positivity is certainly crucial um, in navigating this, you know, highs and lows of the Parkinson's journey. And so what are some practical tips? Um, you know, I've mentioned, you know, taking care of yourself is a good first step in becoming a strong care partner. So how do you do that? Um, I, I warn people to not wait until your tank is low to refuel. Um, how many of us have been driving on a highway and say, we can wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Then our needle gets to E and it's a crisis and we're looking for the next exit. Um, we don't want that for you. Um, so I encourage you to explore outlets and things that make you feel good now, rather than in a, in a time where you're kind of stressed and overwhelmed and in a crisis moment. Um, so start exploring now, you know, things and hobbies that, that feel good to you. Um, one thing that a lot of people find helpful is meditation or yoga it certainly can help with stress and anxiety. Um, for the busy person um, that might not have a moment to do a full 45 or an hour yoga session, um, you could do some quick mindfulness exercises. Uh, an acronym that I like is uh, STOP, S-T-O-P. Um, encourage you to stand up and take a breath and tune into your body um, with physical and emotional scans. Um, and with your breathing to discharge unpleasant uh, sensations or thoughts on your exhales and notice pleasant ones on the inhale. And observing your surroundings, um, you know, being mindful of things that you're grateful for and ask about like the possibility of what's next. What are my steps forward? So in moments when you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, taking a breath can certainly be helpful. Um, when thinking of hobbies that you enjoy, I certainly encourage you to find hobbies that you can do with your loved ones, um, but also take note to have a time, to have some you time <laughs> separate from maybe your spouse, maybe something that you can do on your own um, that you enjoy. Um, I think it's health, a healthy balance of spending time with your loved one and then spending time on you is, is, is crucial. Um, and then again, and I 
can't stress this enough. If you feel really overwhelmed, find someone to talk to that you trust, um, support groups, the Parkinson's community, a mental health provider, whether that be a social worker, psychologist, you know, definitely um, bring it up to someone you trust if you need that help. And so I want to leave you, I know there's, you know, ups and downs, we're talking about challenges and how you can kind of deal with them on your own or with the help of someone else. Um, I want to leave you with, you know, some, some, some positivity or some tools for hope. Um, so how can you be hopeful in the face of uncertainty? Parkinson's is certainly uh, can be a, a, a wild roller coaster um, that has a lot of twists and dips and loops that we don't know about. So it might be, and I want to acknowledge, it might be difficult to maintain a positive attitude or hopefulness in the face of a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I encourage maintaining a, a healthy balance between realism and optimism. And that might mean setting goals uh, for improvement for yourself and for your loved one that are attainable. Um, so we'll, while we want you to shoot for the stars and moons when you're thinking about how to how to deal with the, the Parkinson's journey, um, think about the smaller steps on how to get there and taking one day at a time. And it's, it's okay to have bad days. Um, you know, there are the dips and twists um, and it's very easy to um, harp on the bad days, the, the negative experiences, but I encourage you to take note of the good days as well, because there will be good days, there will be successes. Um, so as easy as, as it is to kind of look back and, and remember the bad days or bad experiences, on the good days, I really want, to, want you to take a breath and, and observe that and celebrate the small successes. Um, and again, this, this is a partnership. In this case, two heads are better than one, and when you expand that community, multiple heads will be better than two. Um, working as a team with one another, with your partner, and with your medical community, medical um, healthcare professionals uh, to fight the disease is important. Celebrate successes and make meaningful connections to others in the Parkinson's community um, or your local community. Um, I encourage you to build a good medical team that is entrusted, um, that one that if you have concerns, you can approach. And these networks, the social networks that you create, the medical uh, team that you create, your community networks um, can certainly enhance the quality of life for not only your partner and your, your loved one with Parkinson's, but a good quality of life for you as well. That'll pass it back to me. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth, for for sharing your expertise uh, on this topic, uh, a, a number of good pearls in there for people to, to take away. And again, there may be some things that you've heard before, but sometimes it's just so valuable to revisit it again and hear it again. There's one question that came in that I think is just timely to your talk. So, um, and, and I think might be valuable for others to hear. So one person says, you know, because I'm so busy, I think that sometimes I have trouble recognizing when I'm stressed. What are some red flags for caregiver burnout that you might help me become more aware of? Sure. Um, so I think it's important um, to note that like emotional responses um, that you have to experience it can be more than just a, a change in your mood. It can be physical as well. Um, and I think that some people might find it more easy to identify those physical changes than the mood changes, so to speak. Um, so I think if someone is starting to experience uh, low energy or overwhelming fatigue, that might uh, impact their ability to function day to day. They're having sleep issues, whether that be sleeping more often or not being able to sleep at all. Um, changes in eating habits, those are things that I think physically can impact one person when they are very stressed. Um, and then if you find yourself neglecting um, your own physical or emotional needs, um, sometimes your care partner's unable to make their own doctor's appointments, um, that certainly can be a red flag. Um, and then one that I hear often as well is uh, becoming, you know, unusually impatient or irritable um, and likely towards their loved one or the person with Parkinson's, but they can also be irritable with others um, in their day-to-day -day life. Those are certainly some red flags that I think um, oftentimes others will notice and might approach the care partner and say, I notice that you're a little bit more impatient with him. 
Um, and I would say, you know, it's, it's not good to hear those things, but I think if you start to hear those on a frequent basis, it might mean um, that you're you're leading into some caregiver burnout and it's important to seek some help for that, some extra support. Mm -hmm. Great, great kind of self-awareness um, tips. Thank, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Okay, so now we are going to turn over to Bill, who's going to speak about his experience as a care partner and navigating the roller coaster. Over to you, Bill. Thanks, Elaine. It's really nice to be here today with everyone. Being a care partner is difficult and can take a toll on the care partner physically and emotionally. Yet, it also has its satisfactions and rewards. Being a care partner is not something that any of us signed up for. And to be an effective care partner and cope with the emotional roller coaster of being a care partner requires emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathically. This is what I strive for. Even though I'm a retired psychologist with training and expertise in this area, I find that there are times I don't handle my emotional reactions as well as I would like. I think back to my initial response when my wife was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I had catastrophic concerns. I was angry, disheartened, and sad. I was envious of friends and others who didn't have a spouse with a debilitating condition. I felt cheated in regards to the retirement that I had hoped for. Then a relief developed, because over a number of years, my wife was functioning well. We were pretty much able to do whatever we wanted to do. We traveled, we became involved in the PD community, we made great friends we would never have met if my wife had not had Parkinson's. And my wife retired so that she could take care of herself better. As you know, that taking care of PD is, is really a full-time job. This led me to pick up things around the house that she had formally done so that she could take care of herself better. But she didn't really require any direct help from me. We both hoped that her continued devotion to doing everything recommended to prevent decline, that she would go on for many years without significant disability. Her immersion in activities that supported a better level of functioning buoyed me and improved my spirits. Then I decided to retire when she was seven years into her diagnosis so I could provide more help that was needed and still take care of myself. Now we are 10 years since her diagnosis. While initially I saw us as a team where I'm the coach with both of us contributing 50-50 to the overall functioning of the household, this has changed. I now have a more active role in making sure the household chores are done and in the planning and smooth running of the household. I continue to function in my role as a coach to my wife and she still does not need my help with her activities of daily living. But as I've had to become more active in my care partner role, there have been stressful times that have been very emotionally challenging. There are times when I feel stressed and emotionally depleted, whereas other times I feel content and fulfilled. I have some examples that have been particularly emotionally challenging for me that I'd like to share with you. One of them is my wife's slowness in getting ready to leave the house when we have an appointment and a time demand where we have to leave at a specific time. The struggle here for me is wanting to allow my wife her independence and as much control as possible versus knowing when I need to intervene. And that's often a very delicate balance. We start the night before by a discussion about when we need to leave the house and planning backwards about when we have to wake up in order to get everything done before we leave. I let my wife be unless I see that she's running behind and we're at risk of not being ready to leave when we need to leave. 
Then I'll tell her how much time is left and even step in to do things that I know that she's able to do, but might take her too long. Emotionally, at that point, I feel anxious and impatient, but I need to remind myself that this is not a passive aggressive behavior on the part of my wife, but rather simply a result of her Parkinson's. I'm fortunate in that my wife is really good at communicating what she needs and also what she does not need from me. And at those times, she's able to do that. Another situation that I find particularly emotionally challenging is my wife's sleep pattern. She and I both know that she will function better the next day if she has a good night's sleep. Yet, there are frequently times where I wake up to go to the bathroom at, let's say, midnight or 1 a.m., and there she is in the den on the computer. Prior to bedtime, we had discussed the need for her going to sleep, her plans for going to sleep, and I remind her about going to sleep at a reasonable time. So when I wake up and I find her there in the den, although I may be angry, I need to stay calm when discussing this because that's really the way I can be most effective. I need to regulate my emotional response and respond empathically, gently but honestly, and not be critical. I need to think about what triggers me at that moment and think before I react. If I'm too emotionally charged to be calm, then sometimes I may need to walk into another room and kind of take a deep breath to kind of soothe myself and then go back in before I respond. Then I can return and talk my, with my wife in a calm and constructive manner and help us to resolve the situation. So what are my overall strategies for dealing with the challenges of this emotional roller coaster of being a care partner? Number one, notice my inner emotional experience. Acknowledge that I frequently have mixed emotions that are triggered with anxiety, sadness, and loss. And number two, that there is a link between my mood and my wife's mood. When she's having a hard time, it really triggers distressing feelings in me. And I need to be careful not to say or do anything to exacerbate her difficulties. Number three. I need to do things that nourish me emotionally. For me, it's reading, taking walks. I sing in two choirs. I like to watch movies. I do a lot of work with my synagogue. And I like to plan trips for us. This has been especially good during COVID, to plan the trips for what's going to happen afterwards. This helps me to fight against fears of losing myself in the caregiving role with all of my needs being ignored. Number four, having a sense of humor. Sometimes I need to find a way to help us both laugh at what might be a difficult situation. Number five, I try to stay in the present versus, versus focusing too much of my time on the future and about what that might bring. I need to remain grateful for what we currently have versus allowing myself to get too overwhelmed with anxiety about what lies ahead. It helps in knowing that I'm providing structure and encouragement to my wife to continue to be motivated to do what she needs to do to slow the decline in her functioning. Next, I really think it's very important to maintain a balance in having an approach to dealing with my emotions as a care partner. What I mean by that is that it's important to acknowledge my negative emotions without significant denial, yet balance this with a sense of hope, love, and gratitude for my wife. We've lost a lot, but we still have a lot that brings us joy. I also lead a care partner group, which brings me a great deal of satisfaction, and I'm a participant in a men's care partner group, which I find very helpful. I think it's important to have a community who understands what we're going through because they're experiencing it just like we are. It's also important to meet with people who are further along in the journey 
because I think this gives you a sense of what might lie ahead. I also try to take care of my own health because if I don't take care of myself, I can't be an effective care partner to my wife. I see my physicians, I exercise, and I watch my diet. Self-compassion. I realize I'm not perfect. I'm not able to do it all. I'll need to ask for help at some point. And I also find comfort and satisfaction in the routine tasks of being a care partner. I find that I enjoy the cooking and the laundry and accepting and adjusting to my position as a helpmate to my wife. I feel effective in that role, even though it can be difficult at times. And finally, maintaining hope that there may be advances in the treatment of PD that will help my wife. So what is my advice to a new care partner? First of all, most importantly, see a movement disorder specialist for the care of your person with Parkinson's. Two, get educated about PD, very, very important. Get active in the PD community. Talk with other care partners. Get involved in a care partner group. Continue with aspects of your life which give you satisfaction and pleasure. Plan to travel while it's still comfortable for the person with Parkinson's. Try to simplify your life as much as possible so you can focus on what is important. For us, that involves selling our house and moving to a one-floor apartment, for example. Think about the future and what plans you may need to make, but don't get stuck there. Enjoy what you have in the present. Encourage and support your person with Parkinson's to exercise and do what they can to optimize their functioning. Realize that you're not going to be perfect and simply do the best you can under challenging circumstances. And realize that being a care partner to someone with PD is a marathon, not a sprint. So my key takeaway message is as much as possible, it's important throughout this whole process to maintain a balanced approach to managing your emotions in terms of this emotional roller coaster. It's important to acknowledge the negative and uncertain aspects of your situation, but balance this with a sense of hope, love, and gratitude for what you have. Thanks. Turn it back over to Elaine. Well, thank you uh, for a, a very honest and authentic sharing of your story and your experience. I, I as I listen to, to you talk, uh, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying, the, the questions and the thoughts that many of the people I work with in my clinical practice often raise. So I think you've probably, um, you know, your words have probably resonated with many who are who are listening today. So I thank you for that. Yeah. I just want to ask um, one question that you might be able to address before we move on. The question that came in, uh, how, how do I begin to develop this balanced approach that you're talking about to manage my emotions um, you, yet while I'm still feeling so stressed? Well, that's a good question because I think <laughs> it is difficult, <laughs> first of all. So I think you need to acknowledge the stress that you're feeling. And that, as I said, you know, it's important to acknowledge the negative emotions. And part of the negative emotions is the anxiety and the uncertainty and the stressful aspects of your situation. I think if you try to deny those or push those aside, they're going to come back in some way. So they're a piece of the picture. So acknowledge them. And then, as I said before, despite that, it's important in the midst of all of this stress to find things that are important to you, to carve out some time to have that balance of something positive or hopeful that you have. It may be difficult to do. It may be hard to figure out, but I really want to encourage you to do that because that's what's going to help you to get through this roller coaster and to balance it out and make it a little more level. Okay. Thank you. Sure. 
All right, Karen. Now I'm, I would like to invite Karen to, to share with us a little bit about her experiences on navigating the roller coaster of caregiving. Over to you, Karen. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Uh, well, my story's a little bit different than Bill's um, because I uh, met my husband when he already had had Parkinson's for 10 years. Uh, we met on Match.com, and uh, Rob was very honest in his profile that he had uh, Parkinson's. And uh, but I loved his profile. It was so uh, clever and witty. And after uh, several weeks of emails and telephone calls, we decided to meet. And uh, after a five hour lunch, I think we decided that we uh, had something uh, going here. So uh, 10 years later, we're still here together. Um, and I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I didn't know a thing about Parkinson's when I met Rob, and uh, he actually gave me a book called uh, Parkinson's for Dummies. Yes, there is a book like that. <laughs> and uh, so I started reading it, and uh, to be honest, it was really so depressing that I just kind of put it aside, and I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to take this one day at a time. And that has pretty much been my approach uh, to dealing with Parkinson's uh, with Rob ever since for the last 10 years. Um, he's in, he, from the very beginning, he invited me to his doctor's appointments and, um, and invited me to ask any questions that I had of the doctors. And to this day, we still uh, create a list together of what we want to discuss with the doctor at the doctor's appointment. So um, it's really become um, a team uh, adventure together uh, on his Parkinson's journey and our Parkinson's journey, really. Uh, and I've appreciated that he, from the very beginning, um, included me in all of this. Um, Rob is a singer and songwriter, um, and that's kind of been his hobby for many years while he was an English teacher. Uh, but then when he got, uh, you know, uh, had to retire with Parkinson's, he really moved more into his singing and songwriting career. And um, he has uh, one of his CDs. Uh, he donated the proceeds, which uh, raised $54,000 for the Brian Grant Foundation. Um, and both of us have been very active as advocates for Parkinson's disease um, uh, with um, working here with the New Mexico uh, University of New Mexico and creating a movement disorder center here uh, on their health sciences campus. And uh, I think that's something that um, really, again, got us together working as a team was getting involved in that ad advocacy. When we moved here to Santa Fe um, from Portland, Oregon, what we discovered was there were no Parkinson's groups here. And so um, you know, I thought, well, okay, we need to get a community going here. And Rob and I started a Parkinson's support group here uh, back in 2014. And we now have about 300 people on our email list. And um, one of the things that we've missed with COVID is that ability to be together uh, because we have that community and um, that community has provided so much support and love to us. And as uh, Bill pointed out, we've had some of the best friends friendships from um, being involved in our Parkinson's community. Um, and and uh, working with our Parkinson's community, Rob and I decided from the very beginning that we were going to be very open and honest about our Parkinson's journey with our uh, PD community and our support group. We've um, been realistic. We don't try to put rose-colored glasses on this situation. Uh, and we've talked about really tough issues from his uh, depression and apathy um, to his uh, loss of mobility over the years. And, uh, and I think this has encouraged other people in the support group to also be really open and honest uh, about this journey. And, um, and I think that open, openness and honesty has uh, allowed us to develop really deep feelings with our community because we have gone to this process of uh, being vulnerable with each other about our journey with Parkinson's. Um, Let's see, I've been asked to speak about the stages of grief and um, I'm not an 
actual believer in uh, in actual stages, you know, like one, two, three, four. Uh, it's more, I think, as Elizabeth pointed out, that these are um, uh, feelings that we have through this process. And they come and go, just like Elizabeth said. Uh, you may have, um, you know, one one stage or feeling at one time, and then uh, that disappears. But then you might revisit it as something else happens in the Parkinson's journey with your partner. So um, for me, uh, I've had the profound gift of um, being able to experience this grief as uh, I've had the uh, experience of watching the man that I love uh, lose his ability to drive, um, his ability to play his guitar, uh, you know, to even walk easily uh, and effortlessly, and at sometimes even his ability to smile at will. So these have been losses not only for Rob, but these have been losses for me as well. Um, you know, and I've also experienced the frustration and anger uh, when he doesn't act, exercise, when he doesn't stay hydrated. Uh, here in New Mexico, where it's very hot, uh, when he doesn't listen um, to my pleas to move slowly and carefully, there's a lot of frustration that can come up from that because, you know, there's times when I just want to shake him like, you're moving too fast, you know, you've got to move slower. We both uh, live in fear of his taking a tumble and, um, you know, breaking a hip or a leg. Uh, I just got a call from one of our Parkinson's community people, and I've got someone in the hospital, the broken pelvis fell down their driveway. So these things happen. And uh, we try to do everything as care partners that we can to keep our care partners safe. Um, I'm also, uh, I hate to use the word harping, but that's how I feel sometimes, like I'm harping uh, to keep him from eating a ton of sugar or when he's not eating uh, enough of the vegetables that I think he should eat. And uh, this role of care partner has made me feel sometimes like I'm a mother. And I, I long for those days uh, when I was just a wife and, and not in this role of kind of like mothering. So uh, what has worked for me? Um, one of the things that has worked for me has been really being very clear about communicating with Rob my needs. And let me give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we were having a conversation about the walker. And um, my feeling was that he was having way too many falls on our Saltillo tile floor and um, that I was fearful that he would break a hip or a leg, or an arm, or, or anything. So I, um, I said, I think we need to get a walker. Well, he was adamantly opposed to getting a walker. And this went on for several months of this back and forth. I think we need to get a walker. No, I'm not getting a walker. Finally, I said to him, I, I need, we need to take this to our counselor. So uh, over the years, we have used a counselor, sometimes individually, uh, sometimes we go in there together. And, and it has been extremely helpful for uh, either of, all of both of us to um, use a counselor to kind of um, rid ourselves of, of uh, feeling sometimes uh, for myself, I will make an appointment and go in there and I'll just say, hand me the box of Kleenex. Uh, this is the kind of session it's going to be today. And uh, but I think it's healthy and good for you to use a third party when times are needed. So with the Walker conversation, we made an appointment. Uh, we went in um, and uh, over the course of that conversation with our counselor, what I did, what Rob said was, um, I feel like it's a nail in the coffin uh, getting this Walker. And it's just like, you know, one more thing taken away from me. And my response was, what if it keeps the nail out of the coffin? And um, the more he thought about that and the more conversation we had with our counselor, ultimately he agreed to get the walker. And he's using the walker to this day, but it hasn't impeded uh, us in any way. Uh, in 2019, we traveled all over the Mediterranean with him with his red walker. So um, it doesn't have to mean that something has changed so dramatically in their life. You're just making adjustments. It's what I call the new normal. So um, some other things that have worked is being a team like this, making these team choices together, 
Um, uh, again, we prepare for doctor's visits together. That's part of our team experience. And then as Bill pointed out and Elizabeth, having that me time. So that might be making lunch, uh, a date with my niece and going out to lunch. Um, I love to just uh, separate myself um, and our house allows it for me to go into my area and, and read my book. I might be knitting in front of the TV, uh, taking the dog out for a walk in nature. Getting out in nature is extremely important for me. And um, so just having that time for yourself. Uh, another important thing for me has been forgiveness. Forgiveness for myself. Sometimes when um, I may not have acted the best way I should have in that circumstance, and I think that probably happens to all of us, and forgiveness for Rob, I don't let it uh, hang, I don't hang on to things, we talk about stuff, and by the end of the day, that's the end of it, I don't like to carry it over into the next day. And then I have a spiritual practice, as Bill pointed out. I do meditation. Um, I do journaling. I have a gratitude journal. And so things like this can be extremely helpful uh, along this journey. So here's some quick advice. Um, make yourself a priority. You have to make yourself a priority in this relationship. And I know that sounds strange, but if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. It goes back to the old saying of, you know, when you're on the airplane and they say, put your, your mask on first before you assist someone else. That's what this is, is taking care of yourself, putting your mask on first. Um, get outside help when needed. Don't wait until your complete frazzled mess. Get it when you need it. Um, Get out in nature, even if it's just to go out and go for a walk, look around, enjoy it, uh, get into a care partner support group. Like Bill said, having that people that are going through the same experience as you is crucially important. And of course, humor, finding humor in every situation. So how do I hang on to hope? Um, uh, my advocacy projects, uh, facilitating my support group. Um, my spiritual practice, and then really going to the point that there's only today and living today the best possible way that I can. Um, we're on this roller coaster, and I can tell you, I honestly hate roller coasters, um, but you've got to make the best of this as best as you can. Um, you're not alone. I'm not alone. We've got our PD community, and um, we're here to support each other. Back to you, Elaine. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> your your story is certainly one. It it's it's a very inspiring one to hear how you have addressed some of the challenges and some of the ups and downs of that roller coaster um, very pragmatically and 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 honestly. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so one question that, that came in while you were uh, talking, you know, just to you, Karen, and then we'll open it up to, to the other questions in the panel. But to you, I'm just wondering, is there one thing that every care partner should do for themselves when on an emotional roller coaster like this? Is there one thing that you would say you've shared so much? You no. Know I think that getting um, a support system, um, a care, you know, a care partner support group, like Bill suggested, um, is crucially important. And and if that's not available to you, finding a therapist or a friend that you can share with in, in some way to, um, I don't like to use the word vent, but to be able to, um, you know, talk about this openly and honestly what you're going through, and uh, and you know there is a tremendous amount of relief in that. But uh, definitely, I would suggest getting into a support group where you can, um, you know, you're with your peeps, you know. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of something that I heard of, a, of, of what, something that a care partner did. She referred to it about creating a psychological family. You know, these, this group of people who are going to be there uh, for you in the good times and in the bad times and who are going to get kind of you and get your experience, the psychological family. And it sounds like that's a bit about what you're talking about. Hey, yeah, I love that. That's that sounds great. 
So now I'm going to uh, just to open it up to some of the questions that have come in through the chat, and we're going to quickly try and address a few of those before our hour is up. Um, one of the real quick ones, which I'd love to address, uh, is right to you, Bill, somebody who uh, is wondering whether or not your uh, support group is available online, and if so, uh, this participant from New Jersey would love to join. Oh, well, thank you. That's that's great to hear. Yes, we are actually you are doing this virtually. We used to meet before COVID in person, but since COVID, we are reading virtually. We meet the third Tuesday of every month at one o'clock. And um, if you give your email somehow into someone at the World Parkinson Coalition and they can send that to me, I will make sure that we get your name on to the list, but we'd love to have anyone who's interested. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you for that. I thought that was a quick and easy one. So we would start there. Um, so one of the questions that's come in um, is about cognitive change. So the question or the comment is, you know, my wife with Parkinson's has cognitive issues and often does not or will not, um, or, you know, is not listening or is unable to follow the suggestions or the ideas that I give to, to try to help. I wonder if any of you have any suggestions on how care partners can get support on navigating this journey when cognitive decline is in the picture or when cognitive decline is a challenge. And this can be open to, to any of you. Well, I guess I can, I can start just by saying that I think that's probably the most difficult aspect of Parkinson's to manage. And because I think it changes the person when their cognitive functioning is, is different. Um, I think with cognitive functioning, the more structure and the more routine that someone has, generally the better they do. And so, you know, it's important to have something be very routinized every day and that they be given something that's within their capabilities to be able to do so that they can feel a sense of efficacy. Because I think one of the things that happens to someone with cognitive issues is they start to lose a sense of themselves. And I think it's really important that, you know, they al they're allowed to do something which restores some of that, but at the same time, you become, in a sense, the frontal load. You know, you, you, you become the one who really um, has to do the planning and organization and, you know, being able to create the safety and all those things. And that's tremendously difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, one, one thing that we've used, uh, found useful is a calendar that has all of our events easily able to, to be uh, visual. And um, we uh, go over that in the morning. And then also um, a list of activities that I might uh, be able to count on Rob to do during the day, take the garbage out, empty the dishwasher, uh, you know, things like that, that, um, that gives some structure to his day. And uh, with a list, he, he knows where to go to look for it. He doesn't have to try to remember it. But cognitive issues are uh, extremely hard to deal with, for sure, just like Bill said. Elizabeth, did you want to add to anything to that? Yes, um, I was just going to reiterate what Bill said as well as about, uh, about structure. Um, and then also with Parkinson's, I think some of the cognitive issues come with executive skills and executive planning. Um, so being able to multitask, here's one thing that kind of becomes harder along the way. Um, so I just usually suggest single tasking <laughs> there's no need to multitask and being able to break down tasks into smaller steps that can be managed um, as it can be helpful and then recognizing limitations that are there so that you're not assigning a task or activity that be that can become frustrating for the person with Parkinson's uh, if it's above what they're able what their meetings are 
Before we get to your key takeaways, because we are getting close to the top of the hour, just in, I just want to do a, a, a combination of some of the questions that have come in the chat regarding kind of resources and how do you find support groups and how do you find ones for men and ones for adult children. And then there was another one about just how do you find a counselor. So just to sum all, I'm just going to say really there are a number of Parkinson's disease organizations that do run uh, these kind of specific niche support groups. So certainly check out Brian Grant Foundation for the adult children. They do uh, some support group. group. The, also the Parkinson's and Movement Disease Alliance also does Parkinson's Foundation. So um, it might require a little bit of homework, but you can certainly look to those resources. And also the Parkinson's Foundation Helpline, if you are looking for a counselor, um, they are a, a great shopping spot, um, you know, a resource of all sorts of information that might be able to give you um, an area specific set of resources for finding uh, a counselor. And so now we're going to take a uh, switch over to the key takeaway points. And so Elizabeth, we'll start with you for, for uh, sharing your key takeaway and move over to Bill and Karen. Sure. So I think um, my key takeaway kind of reiterates a lot of um, what Karen and Bill had said as well. Um, and I just wanted to recognize that it's, you know, normalizing and being okay with um, your emotional responses to challenges and, or successes that you encounter throughout the Parkinson's journey um, and, and being kind to yourself on days that are a little bit harder um, and reminding yourself that it, it is okay uh, to seek additional support for yourself if you do in fact need it. All right, thank you. Bill. Yeah, and in terms of my key takeaway point, in terms of this balanced approach that I'm um, mentioning, again, it's important to acknowledge the negative aspects. Don't shy away from them because they'll find another way to come out. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, even though you may be feeling overwhelmed and stressed, think a little bit about what you still might have, because I think sometimes you can lose that in the midst of all of the daily caretaking and issues that come up. Because I think if you can focus a little bit on that, it can help to fill you up emotionally and to help you to balance out some of the negative aspects. And Karen? Um, my key uh, takeaway is um, to plan for the future and then quit worrying about it. So get all your ducks in a row, get your wills done, get your health uh uh, powers of attorneys done, get all those kinds of things taken care of, talk to your financial planners, um, and then quit worrying about it. And then really start living in the present moment, because each day is going to bring its own uh, challenges and its own gifts. And, uh, and that's just part of the, the journey. Enjoy it, you know, enjoy it as much as you can. You know, this weekend I saw a woman wearing a T-shirt and it said, life is a grand portage. And the word portage really means this idea of carrying, uh, well, it's carrying a canoe or carrying cargo over land, often around an obstacle like a river or between two bodies of water. And, and when I saw her wearing this T-shirt, it really actually made me think about the care partner experience because it is in some way, really navigating obstacles to get from one place to another place. So I really do sincerely thank our panelists for your time and your expertise and your perspective today. And I also want to thank all of you who have joined us, um, who carved time to join us today. So on this page, you can see that there is the, um, the survey button. Please do let us know your thoughts um, about the panel talk topic and about the learning platform and also, you know, any feedback because this truly is how we um, continue to tweak this offering so that we meet people's needs. Um, and remember, anybody who completes the survey does get their name entered in for the draw for the uh, Parky, the, uh, Parky the Raccoon, the mascot. I would just again like to thank our sponsors uh, for making this 2021 series possible, Supernus and Kiwan Kirin, 
And, um, and last but not least, really remember to mark your calendars for the next webinar, which is Tuesday, September 28th. Uh, again, same time at 3, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And it's all about communicating and staying connected when Parkinson's is in the relationship. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy your day.